The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be, since I do not know man? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions for today. Attempt a one sentence summary of today's readings. The Virgin Mary stands out among the faithful of all times. A. List some of her core Christian virtues. B. What lessons must Nigerian Christians of today learn from her? Identify the similarities, if any, between the circumstances of Israel at the time of Jesus, at the time Jesus was born, and our own circumstances today as we approach Christmas. The year 2020 has been a very challenging year for most of our countrymen and women. As Christmas approaches, what message of hope and encouragement will you compose and share with your friends and family members? Who wants to go first? Ekene. I want to answer question four. Four? Yeah. Okay. The message of hope and encouragement that I compose to share with friends and family as Christmas approaches is that Christ is hope and light. Christ is hope and light. So in spite of all our problems, we should fix our focus on the hope and light of Christ. In spite of all our problems, we should fix our hope and light on Christ. We should fix our focus oh. on the hope. 
we should fix our focus on the hope and the light of Christ. Is this a poem or a prose? Oh, it's a poem. Quotes. It's a quote. Ha. Huh. A Kenes quote. A round of applause. <laughs> so Christ is hope and light. He is light of the world. In spite of all our problems, we should fix our focus on the hope and the light of Christ. Light and hope. Those are very powerful Christian virtues. You can't have light where there's no hope, and you can't have hope where there's no light. Hope says that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So hope believes that there's something better that will come out of this present condition. If you don't have the hope that there's light at the end of the tunnel, then it is not hope. Hope works with light. That's a very powerful quote, a Keynes quote. Dr. Helling. Let me attempt question number two. Okay. One of them is obedience. Obedience, okay. Yes. yes. Then she was very humble. Humility. Humility. And then um, prayerful. She was prayerful. Very prayerful. And then... Um, She was um, hopeful. Hopeful, yes. yes hopeful. Let's be say some, so there's some of those that I remember. So, what lessons might Nigerian Christians learn of today, learn from her? We are not prayerful in this country. Some people are prayerful, but we have removed God from our prayers. Most Nigerians now focus on the devil and what the devil can do. So they are fighting the devil instead of looking up to God, hopefully, that God will save us from our circumstances. Nigeria now is in a darkened situation. Like Ekenes said, it's only the light that, you know, and we Christians are supposed to be the light of the earth and so on. So Nigeria has been captured by um, unforgiveness. So most of us here, if you ask, everybody will say that there's somebody, most people will say that there are people that either their parents didn't forgive or they haven't forgiven, and that has held us down. But the Virgin Mary had a plain heart that when the angel came to her, she listened. She forgave the angel. Pardon? She forgave the angel. You are talking no, no, about no, 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 no. She listened to her with an okay. open heart and so on. So whatever was in her heart, she knew that the angel was from God and that God reigns and God is in control and whatever God says. Another virtue we could learn from her is obedience. We are not obedient even unto ourselves. When I say unto ourselves, each and every one of us has a good spirit and a bad spirit. The good spirit tells you do this. The bad spirit says, no, don't do it. Everybody is not doing it, so don't do it. So who, which voice do we listen to? She listened to the voice of God. Whose voice are we listening to? Are we listening to the voice of the media or the social media or what people are saying? Or are we listening to God? I think uh, from her we can learn obedience, humility, and the act of listening. Because in this world today, if you don't listen, you lose your way. These are part of the things I remember. Thank you very much. A round of applause. Obedience, humility, prayer, docility, and open heart, and open mind to God's message. And those two questions are connected. If you list her core virtues, then you find a way to apply them to our Nigerian situation. How do these virtues apply to us Nigerian Christians today? Are we living by the core Christian virtues of the Blessed Virgin Mary that we have outlined, or are we living by other values and virtues? Okay, now who is this? Is this Dominic or Emmanuel? Dominic. I'll to answer question three. Okay. So the, similar, the similarities between the circumstances of Israel at the time Jesus was born and our own circumstances today as we approach Christmas. 
At the time when Jesus was born, in the Jewish community, they were awaiting the Savior because there were a lot of confusions, fake prophecies. A lot of confusion, fake prophecies. And crisis in the community. And crisis. Crisis, confusion, crisis, fake prophecies. Okay. Those are the circumstances in Israel at the time Jesus was born. Okay. And in our community today, as we approach Christmas, we have, we have similar things too as before, as the circumstance when Jesus was born. Are we confused today? Yes. We are confused? Yes. Okay. Is there a crisis in our land? Yes. Okay. Are there fake prophets? Yes. Okay. Have you finished? A round of applause. Okay. But I just wanted to add to question three, the, Dominic, the one that Dominic answered. Okay. That one of the similarities, the, time, the circumstances in Israel, the time of Jesus Christ was born, and our circumstances now, hopelessness. Hopelessness. At that time, the people were grappling with the issue of leadership. They were under the domination of the Roman. And they were looking forward to a leader that will lead them. Same circumstances with us today in Nigeria, that we are grappling with the issue of leadership. There's a lot of hopelessness in the land. And Dominic has mentioned some of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. A round of applause. So we're suffering from the epidemic of hopelessness. There are many people who don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe in the current situation that we are living in. So hopelessness captures the situation of Israel at the time Jesus was born and our own situation now. Many people are hopeless and despondent. Same thing, question one. Okay. One sentence summary of today's reading. What I would say, manifestation of God's eternal and perfect love for mankind. The manifestation of God's eternal and perfect, and perfect love for mankind. The promises. The fulfillment of God's promises that God has long love, just as Jesus has long suffering. The, the love of God is what? It's long. If you count the number of years from the time the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah was given and when it was fulfilled, I mean, biblical history will probably be around 4,000 years. It took 4,000 years for God to bring this to fruition. So God has long love. And this is not love that is accidental. It is eternal. He conceived it from the very beginning, from the foundation of the world. That's a very good summary of today's readings too. Yeah. Okay. The last. I'd like to add to... Question number three, which okay. was uh, dealt with by Kelly. Uh, one of the four Christian values is submission to the will of God. Submission to the will of God. It came out very clearly in the gospel reading. When Mary said she had not seen a man, how will this happen? At the end of the day, she now simply said, I am the handmaid. Let it be done to me according to your word. Now, that can be linked to the circumstance of Jesus Christ, the Garden of Gethsemane, in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, when he said, If this cup of suffering will not pass by, nonetheless, let your will be done. So, one of the key values of standard, that submission, and to us as Christians in Nigeria today, we are encouraged, whatever circumstances that we are passing through, Suffering the pain that is presently bedeviling the country. You should look up to God like Mary did. Say with faith and hope that may the will of God be done in our lives. And of course, in doing this, it calls for faith, a very strong faith. But without our faith, we'll lose it entirely. 
So, in summary, that value, that Christian value of submission, very important in our lives as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. A round of applause. Submission to the will of God. Yes, we Nigerian Christians today want God to submit his will to theirs. We don't want to submit ourselves to the will of God. So we want to dictate for God what he should do for us. Our prayer does not begin and end with, thy will be done. We say, my will be done. So God, do my will. So one of the core Christian virtues of Mary that we need to imbibe and emulate is total submission to the will of God. And submission to the will of God is not just passive acceptance. It is active doing. Because to submit yourself to the will of God is to accept the dominion of God in your life. So to submit yourself to the will of God is acceptance of God's dominion that I will do what God says I should do. So it's not just sitting down there and saying, I have accepted it. No, there's all, I mean, submission is not something that is done once. It's not a one-off thing. It's an attitude of life, meaning that every moment of your life, every minute, every second, you allow the reign of Christ to dictate the pattern of your life. So, submission to the will of God is also doing what? Active hearing, hearing and doing. He who hears these words of mine and acts on them is the one who is a faithful disciple. So, hearing and doing. So, it's, it's an active attitude. It's not just passive acceptance. It's actively hearing. Dr. Helen spoke about listening, the art of listening. Many Christians don't have the art of listening to God, and that is why their prayer is to dictate for God. They are not listening to what God is saying to them. They are concerned about what they have to say to him. Thank you. The first reading of the fourth Sunday of Advent focuses on David from the second book of Samuel. David was the second king of Israel after Saul. While the gospel reading focuses on Mary, a young Jewish woman from Nazareth, chosen to be the mother of Jesus. So the readings today are on two important characters, one of the Old Testament and the other of the New Testament, David and Mary. And in many respects, they have similarities, these two characters, these two biblical figures. Both readings taken together tell us something important about how we read our Bible as Catholics. The Old Testament is the story of God's promise, and that is what we read in the first reading. God's promise to David. After God had delivered David from all of his enemies and settled him in his palace, David says, how can I be living in a house of cedar while the ark of God dwells in a tent? I will build a house for the Lord. He calls prophet Nathan and said this to him. And Nathan says to him, do whatever is in your mind, because the Lord is with you. We will hear that again in the gospel. Look at the time between when Nathan said this to David and when the angel said it to Mary. It's thousands of years. Do whatever is in your mind. The Lord is with you. At the end of the day, God says to David, you are not the one who will build a house for me. I was the one who took you from tending sheep. I led you all through the difficult moments of your life up till this present moment. I will build a house for you. And that's the promise. That's God's eternal promise. The establishment of the dynasty of David. And it is from this line of David that the Savior will come. So what we hear in the, in the first reading, God's promise to David, is actually what the Old Testament is really about. It's the story of God's promise. And the New Testament is the story of the fulfillment of those promises that God made to the people of old. So the way we read our Bible, two testaments but one Bible. Never forget that the two books are two parts of one Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. The two testaments are two parts of one book, and it is indeed one story, one story of God's love. So Old and New Testament is the story of God's love, the promise of his love to David and his descendants forever, and the fulfillment of that promise in the coming of Jesus Christ. So the two readings, when we take them together, they tell us how we Catholics read our Bible. 
that we understand the Old Testament to be the story of God's promise and the New Testament to be the fulfillment of all of those promises. And that's why when we read the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew often goes back to the Old Testament. He says something about Jesus Christ and he says, this is to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets. So he shows us that what is happening in the life of Christ is a fulfillment of the prophecies made to the people of old. So we understand our Bible as the story of God's promise and the fulfillment of those promises. Now when we read the New Testament, we get that sense very clearly that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises made to the people of old. The letter to the Hebrews begins with these words. At various times in the past and in various different ways, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, but in our own time, the last days, he has spoken definitively to us through his son. Underline that word, definitively. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the revelations. So there is no new revelation that we are to expect. Jesus is God's final revelation to mankind. There's nothing that we are to expect after Jesus Christ. And that's what St. Paul is saying in today's second reading. He speaks of Jesus as the what? Revelation of the mystery kept hidden for ages, which has now been revealed, which has now been unveiled to you. So after Jesus Christ, we are not to expect any further public revelation. Jesus is the final point, is the fulfillment of God's revelation. And that is why he too could say at the beginning of his public ministry in the Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to do what? Fulfill them. Fulfillment. I have come not to abolish. So the law and the prophets are not abolished. They have been brought to their complete fruition, to their complete fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. And that is why he can say, no one can take that authority, that divine authority to say, you have heard that God said to the people of old, do this and do this, but now I say to you. So he gives us a better understanding, a better interpretation of what was said in the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets are not abrogated. They still retain their definitive value. The revelation of God to the people of old, which is contained in the Old Testament, is still relevant. It's fundamental. It's the foundation of everything said in the... If you take away the Old Testament, the New Testament will collapse like a pack of cards. If you take away the Old Testament. But if you take away the New Testament, then the Old Testament is an incomplete fragment. So two testaments, they hold each other in tension. Now, one of the stories that fascinates me about how to understand prophecy and fulfillment is the scene of the transfiguration of Jesus. We are told that Moses and Elijah appeared on the mountain with Jesus and Peter, James, and John, and they are having a conversation with Jesus. Moses and Elijah, one representing the law and the other representing the prophets. And then there's this spectacular appearance, a great cloud from heaven, thunderous sound, and then the voice of the Father is said, at this point, Peter, James, and John are what? They are terrified. They fell to the ground, we are told. And then they heard that voice from heaven that says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We hear those same statements where first? At the baptism of Jesus. We hear the statement again at the transfiguration, but with an addition. And what's the addition? Listen to him. The law and the prophets are fulfilled because we are told that when the disciples got up, they saw no one but Jesus. So Moses and Elijah had disappeared. The law and the prophets have been fulfilled. Jesus is the one that we now have to do what? Listen to. So he is their fulfillment. So Moses and Elijah come and they testify. Everything that was said to the people of God that we said, this is the fulfillment of all that we said. He is the one standing here before you. And Jesus needed witnesses. He needed witnesses for that. That's why he went with Peter, James, and John. So that they, because it is Peter who is testifying. He's the one who is, if you read the letter of St. Peter, he goes back to the scene of the transfiguration, all that happened, and how Jesus was established as the final point of God's revelation. So Christians read the Old Testament in the light of Christ. We who are Christians, we read the Old Testament in the light of Christ. And read the New Testament in the light of the old. 
you would never understand what the New Testament is saying were there not an Old Testament. But the fact that we call it Old Testament doesn't mean that it is what? Obsolete. Because the Jews who have what we call Old Testament as the only Bible they have, they don't have a New Testament. That is their Hebrew scriptures. St. Augustine of Hippo gives us a very beautiful quotation. He says, the New Testament lies hidden in the Old and the Old Testament is unveiled in the New. So we hold those two testaments together. That's how we Catholics read our Bible. So be very skeptical of people who put their Bibles under their armpit and say, my Bible says, and then they are quoting out of context a passage of the Bible that they cannot see are in the sense of fulfillment. Quoting the New Testament without references to the Old Testament. Because I say to people, if you want to, if you want to be an excellent Christian, if you want to do good, you will find portions of the Old Testament that are the best portions that will help you. If you want to go on the other side, you will also find passages of scripture that will, that, will, that will nudge you to do that. So how do we understand our Bible, especially of those, those parts of scripture, especially of the Old Testament that causes us so much embarrassment, so much killing? And it is said that God commanded these people to do what? Wipe away this entire city, this entire nation. It causes us some kind of embarrassment. And then when we read the New Testament in the light of Christ, we come to understand this as what? As simply the sign of human depravity. And that's why we need a savior. It explains why we need a savior. Human depravity. In fact, the first good news was given in the context of what? The fall. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. The sign of the woman and her son who will defeat the ancient serpent. So from the very beginning of creation, redemption was already what? Unveiled. So the first reading and the gospel reading help us to understand how we read our Bible. But they also say something important about preparing a fitting dwelling place for God. David has become king over the United Kingdom of Judah and Israel. That helps us to understand what is happening in the first reading, 2 Samuel chapter 7. We need to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 5 and chapter 6 to understand what is happening in chapter 7. Because David was made king over his own tribe of Judah. It was a divided kingdom and Israel was under the control of Son's family. And then later David became king over the United Kingdom of Judah and Israel. He had spent seven years as king of Judah in Hebron. And then later he spent 33 years as king of the United Kingdoms of Judah and Israel. So David was king for 40 years. Seven years in Judah and then 33 years in the United Kingdom of Judah and Israel. So when the kingdoms are united, Judah and Israel, he makes Jerusalem the capital of the kingdom and brings the ark of God to Jerusalem in order to stabilize the unity of the kingdom. That's chapter 6. So the ark of God comes to Jerusalem so as to stabilize the kingdom after the unification of Judah and Israel. Now, what is this ark of God that David brings to Jerusalem to stabilize the kingdom? It was a sacred furnishing containing the law of God. That's the Ten Commandments that God gave to the people of Israel through Moses on Mount Sinai. When you read the book of Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 18, and 24, verse 1 to 18, you know, we get to know what the ark of God really is. It's a sacred furnishing containing the Ten Commandments, the two tablets, the two tablets of stone on which the Ten Commandments are written. Apart from the two stone tablets, the ark also contained a golden jar holding the manna, that's the miraculous bread from heaven with which God fed the people in the desert. So there's something like a chalice, there's something like a ciborium holding the manna. To constantly remind the people of the miracles, the wonders that the Lord did for them while they were journeying through the wilderness. And then the third thing in the Ark of God is the staff of Aaron, the priests. Above the Ark are two cherubim of glory that overshadowed the seat of mercy. Take note of that word, overshadowed, because we will hear it again in the gospel. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will do what? Will overshadow you. Now that's how the 
ark of God looks, you can see the two cherubim, the two cherubs guarding the ark. And this is the passage where God gives an explicit command for the ark to be made to Moses. You are to make me an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, one and a half cubits high. See the measurement. God is the one giving the measurement. He is giving exact measurement of how you measure everything, length, width, and height. You are to cover it with pure gold inside and out. Take note of that because it says something about the new Ark of the Covenant, Mary. Cover it with pure gold in and out. And decorate it all around with a gold edging. Inside the ark, you will place the testimony that I shall give you, the Ten Commandments. Now, this is the sanctuary where the ark is supposed to be during the journey of the people in the desert. For you must build me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them, and you shall make this tabernacle and its furnishings following exactly the pattern I shall show you. So build me a sanctuary. Why does God want a sanctuary? So that he may dwell among the people. So that I will be with you. I will dwell among you. Emmanuel. So that he may dwell with them. Now, if you look at that picture clearly, you can see the sanctuary. The ark is inside that sanctuary. And you can see the 12 tribes of Israel around what? Around that sanctuary. You now come to understand why the life of the nation of Israel revolved around what? The temple. The place of worship. And that's why the greatest tragedy that ever happened to them severally was the destruction of the temple. You, I mean, you destroy the temple, you bring the people of Israel to their knees. Because their whole life was centered around what? The temple of God. That is the place where God makes his dwelling among the people. So that's the sanctuary and surrounded by the 12 tribes. Only the priest, Moses, Aaron, the priest, and then the Levites are expected to go into that sanctuary to offer sacrifices and to commune with God. So, for I will remain with the people of Israel, and I will be their God. And so they will know that I, the Lord, am their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt to live among them. I am the Lord their God. So, the main purpose of all of this is God wants to live among the people. He wants to dwell with them. So we come to the first reading. When David settled in his palace after God had given him rest from all his enemies, he called prophet Nathan and said to him, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God dwells in a tent. See, when the Bible says David is a man after God's own heart, he recognizes that something is not, all is not right. How can I be living in this magnificent house? And look at where the ark of God is dwelling in a tent. I will build a house for the Lord. Nathan replied, go do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. That very night, a message came from God to Nathan. Go back and tell the prophet, go and tell my king, go and tell David the king, my servant, it is I who will build a house for you. And the house that God is saying is not, it's not a physical structure because David was already living. He says, in a house of cedar. So he was living in the best house you could conceive of. But God is saying, I will be the one who will build you a house. That promise is fulfilled in the successor of David, his son, Solomon. He's the one who eventually built this temple for God. So instead of allowing David to build a house for him, God makes a promise to David and sealed it with a covenant. When the time comes for you to rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your son after you, the one born of you, and I will make his reign secure. He shall build a house for my name, and I will firmly establish his kingship forever. Solomon did not become a king, did not remain a king forever. But God is saying, I will establish a kingship that will last what? Forever. Your house and your reign shall last forever before me, and your throne stand, and your throne shall stand firm forever. So God mentions that word three times, forever, forever. This kingdom that I shall build shall stand forever. 
David's descendant Solomon is the king who eventually built the first temple, completed about 950 BC. You know, when people say they love God, I have not seen somebody who loves God as much as Solomon. If you see the temple that Solomon built, even when that temple was destroyed 400 years later, and then was later rebuilt, the people who lived to see that first temple that Solomon built knew that the second temple that was built was only a shadow of the first. The Solomon, it's almost as if everything in that kingdom stood still until he had completed building the temple. The best wood you can think of. The whole altar was gold-plated. I mean, this is money. You can, today, people can say, what, what sort of waste is this? But you know what? what what what's a temple this is a place of communion with the divine when you enter the temple of god it is the bridge between heaven and earth so the church the temple is a sacrament of the divine it's a foretaste of heaven and that's what the church should be that when we get into the church into the presence of god we should feel a sense of being taken out of this world but is that what our churches are today? Many of our churches look like warehouses. Now, so Solomon built this magnificent temple for God. It took him seven years to build the temple. Seven years. He pours money into it. And at the end of the day, he kneels before God at the dedication of the temple and says, I have now built for you a royal house, a place where you may dwell forever. Now, the prophets kept hope alive in God's promise to David. I will establish your dynasty forever. And this is what the prophet Jeremiah says later. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous shoot to David. As king, he shall reign and govern wisely. He shall do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah shall be saved. Israel shall dwell in security. This is the name they give him, the Lord our righteousness. Who can this be talking about? Who can this be about? It can only be about Jesus, the Lord our righteousness. So the prophets kept hope, and that goes back to what we said about how we understand the Bible, Old Testament. All that the prophets were doing was simply to do what? Keep the hope of the people alive for the fulfillment of God's promise. And that is why Simeon could exclaim when he held the child Jesus in his arms at the presentation of Jesus in the temple, now you can do what? Let your servant go in peace because my eyes have seen your salvation. And Jesus would say, many prophets and kings long to see what you see, but never saw it. To hear what you hear, but never heard it. Blessed are your eyes for the see and your ears for the hear. So, God's promise to David is what is now fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, son of David. Jesus is called who? Son of David. And the beginning of the fulfillment of that promise is what we read in today's gospel. So, promise and fulfillment. The, fulfillment, the beginnings of the fulfillment of that promise is what the angelic visitation to Mary announcing the birth of Jesus Christ is all about. Because the angel will say to, to Mary, the son you will give birth to, he will be called the son of the most high. We heard that in the gospel. The Lord God will give him what? The throne of his ancestor, David. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever and of his reign there will be no end forever. So Mary stands at the pivot of this fulfillment. She is the woman whom God chose from all eternity in his eternal love to be the mother of his son, a daughter of Israel, a young Jewish woman of Nazareth in Galilee, a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of who? Of the house of David. So we can see that this is what? Fulfillment. The angel is even going back to what? God's promises to David in the Old Testament. This promise is now fulfilled in the son that will be born of you. Nazareth, Nazareth, that place where the Virgin Mary comes from, not mentioned in the whole of the Old Testament, not mentioned in Jewish history books, 
not mentioned in the Talmud is a rabbinical literature interpretation of the law by the rabbis. It had a population of about 480 people. Nobody of any importance ever lived there. Nothing of any significance had ever happened there. And that's the place that God decides that the mother of his son is going to come from, Nazareth. So God always has a way of doing what? Springing up surprises. Remember that in the New Testament, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Philip went to Nathanael and said to him, we have found the one who Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets as well. Is Jesus, son of Joseph, from where? From Nazareth. And that man replies sarcastically, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that's a recurring pattern in Israel's history. God bypasses important people and places. So often, his favor rests on simple, unlettered folk. People will no go to school. But they are humble. Those are the people God wants to deal with. All of them without influence, power, or prestige. You remember, even when the wise men came to Jerusalem, they said, where is the newborn king? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to do him homage. They stop in Jerusalem because this is, that's the capital. If the newborn king is to be born, where else should he be born other than in Jerusalem? Herod summoned all the wise men and they said to him, well, I'm sorry, it's not here. It's not here. So God has a way of bypassing people of influence and power and prestige. He doesn't give birth to his son in a palace, in a decent home. He gives birth to him where? In a manger. In a manger. So God has a good sense of humor. He knows perfectly well how to confound human expectations and to always spring up surprises. And what that means is never discount anybody. Never discount it. Never look down on anybody. And that's why Pope Francis asks us, let us ask ourselves today, are we open to what? God's surprises. Are you open to God's surprises? Because God constantly does what surprises us. He confounds our expectations. So, we are told in today's gospel that Mary, this young Jewish woman, is betrothed to Joseph. And betrothal constitutes a legally ratified marriage. So, Mary is already married to Joseph. But the wife continues to live at her own family home for another year. So, it is during this moment that Mary is still living at her family home that this message comes to her. And that's why Joseph was even confused too. And he wanted to do away with her words silently in order to spare her any publicity. Because I am married to you. I don't pay your bride price. This one year where you're supposed to learn how to cook for your mama house, you come with this message and say you'll be pregnant. How? Who is that person? So Joseph is confused and he wants, he's a just man. He doesn't want to do or to embarrass her publicly. He says, I don't want to marry you again. As he was contemplating, the angel came, my friend, stop that. <laughs> Take your wife home. Because what is conceived in her is of what? The Holy Spirit. So the angel says to Mary today, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his reign there will be no end. Now, the fathers of the church see Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. So we go back to the Ark of the Old Covenant that God told Moses to make. And Mary today is understood as the Ark of the New Covenant. This is what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says about her. Mary, in whom the Lord himself has just made his dwelling, is the daughter of Zion in person, the Ark of the Covenant, the place where the glory of the Lord dwells. She is the dwelling of God with men. Because why did God ask Moses to make the ark? So that I may dwell among the people. Mary now becomes what? The dwelling place of God with men because she carries the Son of God in her womb. And we will see parallels between the ark in the Old Testament and Mary, the ark of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. The ark, that was the ark of the old covenant, traveled to the house of Obed-Edom in the hill country of Judah. Mary traveled to the house of Elizabeth in the hill country of Judah. You can read those passages in the Bible. When the ark arrived the city of David, it was greeted with great rejoicing. That's the old ark. 
When Mary arrived at Elizabeth's house, she was greeted with shouts of joy. Dressed as a priest, David danced and leapt in front of the ark. John the Baptist of priestly lineage leapt in his mother's womb at the approach of Mary. When David saw the ark, he rejoiced and said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? Elizabeth asks, Why is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? David shouts joyfully in the presence of the ark. Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud cry in the presence of Mary. The ark remained in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. Mary remained in the house of Elizabeth for three months. The house of Obed-Edom was blessed by the presence of the ark. In the short paragraph in Luke, Elizabeth uses the word blessed three times. Her home was certainly blessed by the presence of Mary and the Lord within her womb. The ark returns to its home and ended up in Jerusalem, where God's presence and glory is revealed in the temple. Mary returns home and eventually ends up in Jerusalem, where she presents God incarnate in the temple. In the Ark of the Old Covenant, God came to dwell among his people with a spiritual presence. But in Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, God comes to dwell with his people with a physical presence. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. A knowledgeable Jew, these parallels, what we call typology, meaning that the Ark of the New Covenant, the Ark of the Old Covenant is a type, it's a type, it's a prefiguration of the Ark of the New Covenant. Any Jew that reads these passages in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it will almost be as if you flip on the light for him. The Ark of the Old Covenant contained the Word of God inscribed on stone. Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, carried the Word of God in flesh. So this is not Word of God on stone. It is word of God in flesh. The Ark of the Old Covenant carried the golden urn holding the manna, the miraculous bread from heaven that kept God's people alive in the wilderness. Mary carries in her womb the bread of life come down from heaven that brings eternal life. He told the people, your fathers, your fathers ate the manna in the desert and they are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Just as the glory of the Lord overshadowed the ark and the tabernacle, so the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary as the new dwelling place of God. So these are the parallels when you read what is said about the ark in the old covenant and Mary the ark of the new covenant. So it's the it's the fulfillment of God's promise. What we are experiencing is the fulfillment of God's promise. So the angel says to Mary, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. These are important statements in that conversation between the angel and Mary. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. How can this come about since I am a virgin, since I know not man? Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. These two phrases of the angel's greeting shed light on each other. Mary is full of grace because the Lord is with her. The grace with which she is filled is the presence of him who is the source of all grace. And we'll find this, this same, this same, that powerful statement said to Mary, full of grace. We'll find it said about Jesus. And that, the point is that Mary shares in the fullness of grace from the very source of grace. And that very source of grace is the one that she's carrying in her womb. Because the evangelist John speaks of Jesus, the Son of God, as full of grace. The same statement made to Mary, as full of grace and truth. From his fullness, we have all received 
grace upon grace. So we to share in that fullness of grace that God pours out in abundance upon us because he has made his dwelling among us. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. The point is, why Mary? You have found favor. Why Mary? Why was she the one favored by God of all women in the world at the time? Is it education? She no get them. Is it lineage? Who knows her? So what is it about Mary? Why is she the one that God chose? This lowly girl from Nazareth, a place that is not known, that is never mentioned anywhere. No important person comes from there. This is purely an act of what? God's grace on merit. And that's what grace is, gratis. It's what? God's free gift. And he gives to anyone that he wills freely. You cannot quarrel with him. Why be envious? Because I am what? Generous. So this is why Mary exclaims in her Magnificat, The Almighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. How can this come about since I am a virgin? Mary's virginity is the sign of her faith. Remember that God told Moses, build this ark and plate it with gold in and out. That's a sign of Mary's virginity, unadulterated by any doubt, and of her undivided gift of herself to God. She is gold. What do we call her in the litany? House of Gold. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. This fiat expresses Mary's obedience of faith. We spoke of obedience, total submission to the will of God as one of the core Christian virtues of Mary. A total self-surrender to the will of God. She is certain, as the angel has said, that nothing is impossible to God. By entrusting ourselves to Mary, we to enter into this dynamic of total self-surrender to the will of God. And that's the, that's the easiest way to surrender yourself to the will of God. Enter into the dynamic of Mary. Let her be your mother. And you will learn what total submission to the will of God is. With her, we too can say, thy will be done. So, dear friends, we come to the end of our homily. Then Louis Maria de Montfort, in this book of his, True Devotion to Mary, which is adjudged to be the greatest book ever written about Mary. This is what he says. We must cry out with the saints, De Maria numquam satis. Of Mary, there is never enough. We have not yet praised, exalted, honored, loved, and served Mary as we ought. She deserves still more praise, still more respect, still more love, and still more service. So when people are saying, why do you, why do you talk about Mary, talk about Mary like this? It's a, it's a function of their own defective Christology. Their knowledge of Jesus is reductionist. Because what the church believes about Mary is based on what she believes about Christ. Because the point is, why Mary? If not for the sake of Christ, why Mary? Everything is about so every honor we give to Mary ultimately redounds to who? To God. Because she says, the Almighty has done great things for me. She doesn't say, holy is my name. Holy is his name. So whatever honor we give to Mary, on account of being specially chosen by God, ultimately redounds to the glory of God, who is the one who honored her first. And that's why she can say, from now henceforth, all generations will call me blessed because the Almighty has done great things for me. So she acknowledges what God has done for her. So when people say, why do you talk about me? Why do you talk about Mary? It's a function of their understanding of Christ is what? It's defective. If they have a full knowledge of Christ, they will come to a better understanding of who his mother is. And that's why I end with this quotation from Pope Benedict XVI. The church invented nothing of her own when she began to extol Mary. She did not plummet from the worship of the one God to the praise of a woman. The church does what she must. She carries out the task assigned to her from the beginning. The church neglects one of her duties, one of the duties enjoined upon her when she does not honor Mary. She deviates from the word of the Bible when her Marian devotion falls silent. When this happens, 
she no longer glorifies God as she ought. The Magnificat shows that Mary is one of the human beings who, in an altogether special way, belongs to the name of God. So much so that we cannot praise God rightly if we leave Mary out of account. We cannot praise God correctly if we leave Mary out of account. Heavenly Father, you prepare the Virgin Mary to be a worthy mother of your son. You let her share beforehand in the salvation that Christ will bring by his death and kept her sinless from the first moment of her being. Help us by her prayers to live in your presence without sin. Give us something of her obedience. Give us something of her faith. Give us something of her humility. Give us something of her docility. Give us something of her purity. Give us something of her total surrender to your holy will. May your will be made manifest in our lives through Christ our Lord. Amen.